the affluent class in China finds themselves in dire straits, facing unprecedented challenges. Amidst this turmoil, many have opted to voice their discontent through protests, while others teeter on the brink of starvation. Both foreign and domestic investors are losing faith in the Chinese market, exacerbating the economic downturn. Even the most prosperous individuals are not spared from the turmoil, as the stock market takes a sharp downward turn, plunging them into unforeseen hardships. Leading up to the Chinese New Year festivities on January 26, RT Mart Jiangxi made headlines by declaring its imminent closure on February 6. The illustrious Jiangxi International RT Mart Supermarket, with its impressive 27,000 square meters of retail space, commenced operations in a grand ceremony back on January 22, 2015. Nine prosperous years later, it bids farewell to its patrons. As of now, RT Mart remains silent on the rationale behind these closures. Recent data from Yan Commercial paints a sobering picture. Since January 2023, no less than 13 RT Mart establishments scattered across regions like Hunan, Jiangxi, Hubei, and Sichuan have either shuttered their doors or made ominous announcements. The predominant culprits behind these closures seem to be expiring lease contracts and strategic business adjustments. Notably, the Pudong branch, which debuted towards the end of 2018, faltered after a mere four years of operation, bowing out of the retail scene. Traditionally seen as a beacon of support during times of crisis, the government now evokes feelings of disillusionment and despair among its populace. The ruling CCP, once hailed as a force for progress, is now perceived as a catalyst for societal decay, driving many to question its intentions openly. Some have even gone as far as to implore foreign intervention. Viewing it as the only solution to curb the CCP's influence and restore stability, the Chinese economy is currently in a severe recession, with every industry lamenting their plight. It's really tragic because such a massive event, like the annual department store exhibition, has seen a significant decline this year, not only in terms of the number of exhibitors but also in terms of the number of vehicles carrying goods, which has decreased by at least one third. If you look from W1 to W5, you'll see empty spaces, almost one third of them. And from the current trend, it looks like this will continue. We really need to seriously consider whether to continue participating in the exhibition. Where are they? There's this guy who's always at trade shows, and he's saying things are really tough. He's talking about these big expos happening after the Lunar New Year, and he's pretty sure about one thing: the world is kind of moving away from China. For Chinese businesses, it's not looking like this will change anytime soon. So, what do we do? There are still some big shows happening in China in March. We'll have to see how things go and get ready. I saw this post from someone online. They were talking about how tough it is for rural women. They start working at 4:30 in the morning, and they're only making 10 bucks an hour. It's crazy. And then there's this job fair in Hangzhou. It's like everyone there has a master's or a PhD. It's nuts. And in just one hour, over 10,000 people showed up. It's really hard to find a job. A Japanese language graduate, after returning from studying abroad for a year, is struggling to find a job. She's feeling lost and desperate, having sent out dozens of resumes every day for a month, totaling over a thousand. She hoped the job fair in Chengdu would bring some luck, but it only deepened her disappointment. It's the spring talent recruitment fair in Chengdu. She noticed there were a lot of people, but not many job openings, and most of them required at least a bachelor's degree. It's crowded, really crowded. Trying to get to a booth is like pushing through a crowd at a concert. And if you're aiming for a decent company, forget about it. The lineups are insane. Finding a job is tough. Just look at all these people struggling. Many netizens are saying they couldn't find work in Shanghai and had to return home empty-handed, feeling bitter and helpless. They came out expecting to earn tens of thousands, but ended up spending thousands and couldn't land a decent job. It's tougher in 2024. It's getting harder and harder in manufacturing too. This lady mentioned she was on a business trip to a new factory in Zhejiang. It was built with investments from the previous year, with the boss pouring in a lot of money earned in Shanghai. Just the renovation cost over 20 million, and this red sprinkler system on top was a requirement from the safety department, costing over a million. The ventilation system alone cost over two million, and there are three floors in total. She went through the whole process with the boss, so she understands the struggle. Setting up a new factory nowadays, with all the environmental assessments, safety evaluations, and occupational assessments, took about half a year. The regulations were so strict, but from the perspective of a business. The government is being too meticulous, making it impossible for companies to survive. They didn't realize how serious it was until they faced unreasonable demands. Even getting a simple approval took two to three months. It was incredibly difficult.
Now, if someone wants to start their own business or if a small or medium-sized enterprise wants to invest, manufacturing is incredibly tough. You just can't make it happen, the government regulations are too tight, it's impossible to continue, and now profit margins are getting lower and lower. Since the pandemic, we haven't had as many orders, factories are empty, and it's really bleak. Look at the restaurant scene in Beijing, it's a mess. A guy who used to run a closed-down restaurant said the place next door has been offering a 78 yuan meal deal for two with grilled fish for a month now, and they're still not getting any business. He said, if everyone keeps losing money like this, who will dare to open a shop in the future? The situation in Shenzhen will shock you. A man from Shenzhen said there are fewer delivery guys now, but they're still not getting enough orders. It used to be bustling with beautiful women and fancy cars at 9 in the evening in Futian. Now, it's deserted, houses can't be rented out, but many jobless people are staying in hotels. The second-hand housing market in Shenzhen has exploded, with over 100,000 properties up for auction, but fewer people are buying. I had a client with a house priced at 28 million yuan, he dropped the price by 10 million due to urgent need for cash, but still couldn't sell it. I've noticed the loan industry is also slow. Business owners looking for financing to expand production have decreased, even though it's been years since the pandemic. Why are things still like this? The challenges facing grassland cattle and sheep farming are evident, costs have surged, leaving herdsmen bewildered. A woman from the grasslands expressed the severity, stating, this year is unbearable. I'm giving up. The expenses of raising cattle and sheep have soared, yet the prices of beef and mutton have plummeted. How can we sustain this? March arrives amidst freezing weather and lambing season, with no signs of snow thawing. 2024 is proving to be a nightmare for us herdsmen, continuing seems daunting. Grass costs have reached historic highs, averaging about 90 cents to a yuan per pound, surpassing even corn. People inquire why our beef and mutton prices remain unchanged despite market drops. The truth is, over 90% of market beef and mutton isn't natural grass-fed. Traditional pasture-raised beef and mutton, following natural cycles, not only failed to profit but have been losing money for two years. This is our reality in Hilunber. If we can't endure this year, cattle and sheep farming won't persist next year. Finding pure, natural grassland free-range beef and mutton in the market will become exceedingly challenging. The severity of the downward pressure is emphasized. A netizen remarked, it's not about what you want to do, it's about whether you can still do business. Industries are oversaturated and insular, even prominent figures struggle. Professors resort to odd jobs and host pedal products. Competition is fierce, your superiority counts for little. Shanghai's influx declines significantly. A resident noted, 40% of storefronts near me lie empty, three of which were once restaurants, now leased by major landlords. Taxi and ride-hailing drivers lament their situation. They forewent returning home for New Year's to drive in Shanghai, hoping for higher earnings. Yet platforms offer no incentives, and orders dwindle. Even with 12-hour shifts, they barely earn 5 to 600 yuan daily, falling short of 10,000 yuan monthly after expenses. 10,900 Chinese chip companies vanished, up nearly 90% from last year. As of December 11, 2023, China has seen a staggering 10,900 chip companies shut down or have their registrations revoked by the industrial and commercial authorities. That's an average of over 31 chip enterprises closing down or having their registrations revoked every single day. In the past five years alone, more than 22,000 chip-related businesses have faced closure or revocation. According to data from Oriental Wealth Choice, as of November 1st, 151 semiconductor-listed companies have disclosed the third-quarter reports for 2023, with a total operating income of approximately 352.3 billion yuan, almost flat compared to the same period last year. However, their combined net profit attributable to shareholders has plummeted by about 54% to around 19.3 billion yuan. Shockingly, out of these 151 listed semiconductor companies, a staggering 111 have seen their net profits plummet year on year, accounting for approximately 74% of the total. For instance, in October, AI chip design company Cambricon released its third quarter financial report, revealing a staggering 66.15% year-on-year drop in operating income to 31.34 million yuan, with a net loss attributable to shareholders of a whopping 263 million yuan. From January to September 2023, Cambricon's revenue plummeted by 44.84% year-on-year to 146 million yuan, with a net loss of 808 million yuan. Furthermore, 
data shared by Professor Wei Xiaojun, Director of the China Semiconductor Industry Association's Integrated Circuit Design Branch at ICAD 2023, indicates that there are a total of 3,243 chip design enterprises in China, with a shocking 55% of them generating less than 10 million yuan in sales revenue. Among China's semiconductor-listed companies, 30% are in the red, with an overall net profit decline of about 54%, and a staggering 74% of them witnessing a decline in net profit. Experts predict that the majority of Chinese chip design companies will face massive losses in 2023 due to severe inventory backlog, saturated industry supply, and the inevitable devaluation of stock due to the flawed economic development policies of the Chinese Communist Party. Hitting a staggering 4.5 billion renminbi loss, Chinese supermarket chains collapsed. In a shocking turn of events, renowned supermarket chains Ren Renal, Bubugeo, and Yongwei Superstores have all reported staggering losses, sending shockwaves through the market. On January 30, 2024, the well established Shenzhen supermarket chain Ren Renal issued a notice stating that 2023 net loss of 470 to 520 million yuan compared to 507 million yuan in the previous year. Rim Rill cited various external and internal factors for declining revenue and underperformance. Originating from Shenzhen, Guangdong, Rim Rill once rivaled major foreign giants like Carrefour and Walmart. Despite going public in 2010 with over 10 billion yuan in annual revenue and 100 plus stores nationwide, Rim Rill faced financial struggles since its first loss in 2012. This marks Rim Rill's third consecutive warning of delisting due to losses compounded by a rising asset liability ratio of 108.7% by the end of the third quarter of 2023. Following suit, Hunan's leading retail enterprise, Bubugeo, released an announcement estimating a loss of 1.32 to 1.96 billion yuan attributable to shareholders of the listed company in 2023. At the same time, the company still faced the risk of bankruptcy due to the failure of restructuring as declared by the court. Specifically, Bubugeo anticipates a net loss between 1.32 billion and 1.96 billion yuan, marking a decrease of 22.94% to 48.11% compared to the previous year. The company attributed these losses to intensified industry competition and a liquidity crisis, resulting in operational challenges. Bubugeo responded by adjusting its strategy, optimizing store operations, and closing in profitable outlets, incurring significant expenses. Additionally, the liquidity crisis impacted Nanching Department Store's performance, prompting concerns about goodwill impairment. The company expects a decline in the overall fair value of investment properties, subject to evaluation and audit by appointed agencies. Yongwei Superstores, another heavyweight in the supermarket industry, was not spared from the financial turmoil. Revealing a net loss of 1.34 billion yuan for 2023, the company experienced a consecutive decline in profitability, with losses totaling 4.495 billion yuan in 2021 and 3 billion yuan in 2022. Faced with relentless competitive pressures and a deteriorating economic landscape, Yongwei Superstores struggled to adapt, resorting to impairment tests on long-term assets as domestic stock prices plummeted. The unfolding crisis has cast a shadow over the future of these once-thriving supermarket giants. As uncertainties loom large, investors and industry analysts alike are left questioning the effectiveness of their strategies and the viability of their operations in the tumultuous retail landscape. $200 million job losses stem from China's small business bankruptcy wave. China is teetering on the edge of an economic abyss, as not only the titans of real estate and finance face financial ruin, but also a tsunami of small and micro enterprises stares down the barrel of closure, putting a staggering 180 million jobs on the line. Shocking figures reveal that in the first half of 2023 alone, 460,000 companies shuttered their doors, 3.1 million solo ventures vanished into thin air, and a staggering 3.73 million eateries closed up shop, leaving a trail of economic devastation in their wake. With 200 million people out of work, the nation is on the brink of an unprecedented crisis. A recent report from the China Institute for Inclusive Finance paints a grim picture of the financial health of small and micro enterprises. More than a third of surveyed businesses confessed to dire financial straits, 
with regions like Hunan and Shanxi particularly hard hit. Meanwhile, a gaping disparity in financial stability plagues enterprises in Guangxi and Chongqing. With a staggering 80% of small businesses drowning in overdue payments, the pressure on cash flow is reaching a breaking point. As debts pile up, the specter of bankruptcy looms large, threatening to send shockwaves through the economy and plunge 180 million people into joblessness. On a global scale, small and micro-enterprises are the lifeblood of economies, contributing a lion's share of employment and GDP. In China, they provide a whopping 70% of all jobs. Yet, these enterprises lack the resilience of their larger counterparts, grappling with financing woes and a lack of technological edge. Should over 80% of them continue to face payment delays, the fallout could be catastrophic, with nearly 200 million livelihoods hanging in the balance. It's a grim reality, with a quarter of small businesses already on the brink of collapse. As China's stock and real estate markets spiral downward, investor confidence plummets to new lows. Even in major cities like Guangzhou and Shanghai, where purchase restrictions were lifted, December's sales plummeted by a staggering 17.1% year-on-year. This freefall underscores a widespread loss of faith in China's economic prospects, both at home and abroad. With banks tightening their grip on loans to small businesses and no relief in sight, the impending wave of closures and bankruptcies seems inevitable. Adding fuel to the fire, the closure of small and micro-enterprises threatens to send shockwaves through the economy, disrupting supply chains and driving up prices. The ripple effect will reverberate far and wide, inflicting further misery on already beleaguered citizens and exacerbating economic woes. Chinese illusion of national trend free house giveaways, a deceptive reality. In recent times, there has been a surge in the real estate market with a trend of giving away houses for free. Several homeowners have come forward offering to transfer their properties for the remaining amount of their mortgage loans. Take Fang Qing from Zihui City, Xiaoqing, for instance. Her property, currently valued at 470,000 yuan, is roughly equivalent to her outstanding mortgage balance. While this may appear to offer buyers a chance to acquire the property at a discounted rate, the actual implications of such transactions may not be as advantageous as they seem. Who's willing to pay off my mortgage? I'll give the house away for free to whoever does, and you didn't hear it wrong. In the past few days, there's been a screenshot from an owner's group, and the chat messages in it say just that. This, you see, is a real thing, not just spreading negativity unintentionally. I remember back then many new property projects required reservations and were locked in specific units. This owner even said in the group that whoever wants it can have it, with unconditional cooperation for notarization and transfer, and they'll even cover the first month's mortgage payment for you. It's not hard to see that this owner bought the house in Huizhou during the peak of the real estate market. Now, the house should be worth around 600,000 yuan, but with mortgage rates dropping, they're out almost 400,000 yuan. For ordinary folks, that's catastrophic. They're even willing to cover the first month's payment for the new owner. Is this desperation due to a bad market or just a temporary slump? Behind the trend of free house giveaways, there are hidden risks. Firstly, owners may be facing financial difficulties and debt problems, potentially leading to property seizure or foreclosure before transfer. Secondly, if property prices continue to fall, buyers may face even greater economic losses. Furthermore, this type of transaction may involve high loan amounts and interest rates, which may not truly benefit buyers. On the surface, buyers may think they are getting a property at a relatively low price, but this could come with high loan interest, potential legal disputes, and even risks of the property's value decreasing. Especially for investors who were previously speculating in the property market, the current environment is significantly different. The uncertainty of property prices, Changes in market supply and demand, and policy adjustments all serve as reminders to approach the real estate market with caution. 20 million unfinished homes drive tens of millions in China to tears. A report recently released by Nomura Securities points out the staggering scale of unfinished pre-sale housing in China, estimating around around 20 million units of unfinished homes across China, left by Evergrande and other failed developers. This figure is equivalent to approximately 20 times the size of China's largest private real estate developer, Country Garden Holdings. 
the total funding gap for completing those projects stood at around $446 billion, the report estimated. Experts warn that this situation could have a significant impact on both society and the economy, with some criticizing the Chinese government's response as a slow and ineffective remedy, suggesting that pouring more resources into the issue may yield limited results and fail to prevent a collapse in the real estate market. Taiwanese financial expert Huang Shih-sung recently analyzed that the inability to complete these 20 million housing units could have a significant impact on both society and the economy. This is a massive quantity, and previously, Beijing hoped that companies like Country Garden or Evergrande could at least deliver completed housing units on schedule. Recently, some industry insiders in China have reported online that property prices in Shenzhen have experienced a stampede-style collapse. In some areas, such as the central district of Baolin, the price of commercial housing has plummeted from over 4.2 million yuan to 1.85 million yuan, a drop of over 55 percent, while other areas have experienced declines of around 40 percent. Previously, Bloomberg reported, citing sources, that the central bank is set to launch the three major projects this month, with specific implementation plans. This initiative aims to inject at least 1 trillion yuan of low-interest funds into policy banks in stages through measures such as mortgage supplementary loans, PSL, and special loans to stabilize the sluggish real estate market. The so-called three major projects include affordable housing, urban village renovation, and dual-use infrastructure in urban areas. American economist Davy J. Wong, authorized by Davy J. Wong, analyzed the current situation differently. Because there is currently an oversupply of real estate, Wong suggests that if this trillion yuan were allocated solely to building affordable housing, urban village renovations, and public facilities, it may not be as effective. Instead, Wong believes that the funds should be used to acquire some developers or assist them in completing unfinished buildings. Alternatively, providing housing subsidies to residents in the form of monetary assistance for purchasing or renting homes might be more effective than constructing new housing units, given the oversupply in the market. First time in 17 years, China no longer the U.S.'s top importer. According to a report by Nikkei Asia on the 10th, China has for the first time in 17 years lost its position as the top importer to the United States. This shift is attributed to a decrease of at least 20% in imports from China to the United States from January to November 2023 compared to the same period two years prior. Mexico is likely to replace China as the primary importer for the United States in 2023, reflecting a trend of increased trade with friendly nations and reduced reliance on China. Last July, after the General Administration of Customs of China released monthly import and export figures, several Chinese financial media outlets pointed out that China was no longer the largest importer for the United States. According to Nikkei Asia, based on trade statistics from the U.S. Department of Commerce, China has fallen below the top spot in annual share for the first time since 2006. From January to November 2023, China accounted for only 13.9% of total imports to the United States, the lowest level since 2004. Peak imports from China to the United States occurred around 2017, exceeding 21%, creating a significant gap compared to other countries. Analysts attribute this change to the initiation of the U.S.-China trade war in 2018, leading to a continuous decline in trade volume between the two countries, thus removing China from its position as the largest trading partner of the United States. By 2020, with the outbreak of the global pandemic, China resumed production ahead of other countries, once again becoming the largest trading partner of the United States. However, as the United States strengthened efforts to reduce dependency on China and adjusted global supply chains following the pandemic, imports from China decreased once again. Trends are emerging in categories such as electronics, which previously heavily relied on imports from China, shifting towards other countries. For instance, imports of smartphones from China decreased by 10% year-on-year from January to November, while imports from India increased fivefold. Similarly, imports of laptops from China decreased by 30%, with imports from Vietnam quadrupling. Although still relatively small in scale, procurement from Southeast Asia is rapidly increasing. This shift is partly driven by U.S. government policies. The Biden administration is promoting the establishment of supply chains with friendly shores among allied nations. Additionally, 
tariffs imposed by the Trump administration on Chinese products worth $370 billion continue to be enforced. Against a backdrop of geopolitical risks, global companies are adopting the China Plus One strategy to avoid excessive reliance on China. Analysts predict that the impact of this trend will persist in the long term, with Neil Graham stating that it may take several years for the China Plus One strategy to significantly affect U.S. import statistics. Welcome to Shanghai Pudong Airport, where things are surprisingly quiet. There aren't many people around, which is quite unusual for this time of year when it's usually bustling with travelers. It's a bit bleak to see the airport so deserted. Many duty-free shops and famous restaurants here have closed down. Terminal 2 at Shanghai Airport is really quiet. Even though they say to come early, hardly anyone is there, so the terminal is almost empty. It's not just Shanghai, though. Other airports in China are quiet too. Why is it so calm during the busy Chinese New Year travel time? I left early, thinking there would be lots of traffic in lines at the airport. But when I got there, it was strange. There was nobody at the busy entrance, and security was quick with no lines. The gates were empty too. This unusual quietness makes me wonder why it's not as busy as usual during this busy travel time. Chongqing Jiangbei International Airport, the once bustling T2, is now deserted. What do people think about this? A netizen from Chongqing revealed that passing through Chongqing T2 terminal, the huge airport is empty, and it seems like most airlines have moved out, leaving only one noodle shop. It seems Chongqing's economy is still struggling to support the ongoing weak economic recovery post-pandemic. Chinese authorities have introduced a range of measures to attract more foreign businesses and tourists, including easing visa requirements for American visitors. Now, American tourists no longer have to provide documents like round-trip tickets or hotel reservations. In a bid to strengthen ties, the Civil Aviation Administration of China plans to boost direct flights between China and the U.S. from 48 to 70 per week during the winter and spring seasons of 2023 to 2024. However, despite these efforts, there are concerns about China's economic outlook, with experts warning of weakened exports and investments. To counteract this, Chinese authorities are focusing on stimulating consumption, offering visa-free benefits to encourage spending by tourists. Yet, despite these policies, traveling to China remains challenging, particularly for Americans. The disparity in mobile apps between the U.S. and China poses a significant inconvenience, as downloading Chinese apps requires extensive personal information and a local phone number. Moreover, the shift away from cash and the inability of American phones to use popular Chinese navigation apps like Baidu and Amaps add to the travel hurdles. Scholars and tourists alike face practical issues such as making mobile payments, while concerns about personal privacy and security loom large. The strict identity verification requirements in public places, including the collection of biometric data like fingerprints, contribute to the discomfort experienced by foreigners in China. Additionally, Worsening U.S.-China relations and the enforcement of laws like the anti-espionage law have heightened concerns about legal detainment, prompting the U.S. State Department to caution Americans against traveling to China, categorizing it as a level 3 risk area. Chairman of the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee, Republican Rep. Michael McCall from Texas, has cautioned Americans about the potential dangers of traveling to China. Last June, the U.S. State Department issued a Level 3 travel advisory due to concerns about exit bans and wrongful detentions, advising U.S. citizens to reconsider trips to mainland China, highlighting cases like that of Mark Swyden from Texas, who faced arbitrary detention in Guangdong province in 2012. McCall emphasized the severe human rights violations suffered by those detained in China. Swyden, a Texas resident, was apprehended while purchasing construction materials and later charged with drug-related offenses. McCall raised alarm about the Chinese Communist Party's surveillance practices, warning that connecting to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth networks in China could expose travelers to data extraction from their electronic devices. He further cautioned that social media accounts might be scrutinized for any anti-China sentiments, even outside mainland China. In some instances, he noted, plainclothes police may tail foreigners. As an alternative, McCall advised Americans to reconsider their travel plans to China and explore visits to ally countries and partners in the Indo-Pacific region. He is concerned about deteriorating U.S.-China relations, highlighted the increased risk of unlawful detention, particularly with the enactment of the new anti-espionage law. The Chinese government's encouragement of citizens to report individuals associated with agencies like the FBI has created an unwelcoming atmosphere for potential visitors. Moreover, the revised anti-espionage law expands the definition of espionage activities, offering rewards to those who report such activities, including accommodations and monetary incentives. 
Eight months since China reopened its borders, the influx of foreign tourists has a bounce back to pre-pandemic levels, despite life in the country returning to relative normalcy. The absence of international travelers is starkly evident in major cities like Beijing and Shanghai, which have seen less than a quarter of their usual tourist numbers in the first half of this year. So, why are international tourists giving China a pass? According to the Beijing Municipal Bureau of Statistics, Beijing welcomed about 407,900 international tourists from January to June this year, a significant increase from 2022 but still down by 11% compared to 2019. Similarly, Shanghai saw a decline of 13.8% in inbound tourist numbers during the same period. Matthias Teratas, the general manager of the Bulgari Hotel in Shanghai, notes that foreign travelers now make up less than 10% of the hotel's total guests, mainly comprising business travelers and luxury brand management teams. In the first part of this year, Chinese travel agencies only saw about 52,000 visitors coming in from other countries. That's a huge drop from the 3.7 million visitors they got during the same time in 2019. Some might think it's because it was the low season after the pandemic restrictions eased, and things were supposed to get better in the second half of the year. But that's not what happened. In July, China got about 1.7 million visitors, which is a lot more than before. However, only 86,000 of them were foreigners. This shows that even during the busy summer months, the number of foreigners coming to China didn't go up compared to earlier in the year. Foreign tourists visiting China face various challenges, including difficulties in accessing payment systems and accommodations. Nick Chen, a resident of Hangzhou, describes China as a potential nightmare for tourists without a Chinese SIM card and popular payment apps like WeChat or Alipay. Laura Pan, a professor at Italy's Bocconi SDA University, encountered payment challenges upon her return to China, despite being Chinese. WeChat Pay, for instance, posed ID verification issues for foreign mobile numbers, while Alipay offered a somewhat smoother experience. Moreover, many Chinese hotels lack the qualifications to host foreign guests, contributing to accommodation challenges for overseas tourists. Shopping and transportation can also be daunting, with most establishments favoring mobile payments over cash. Sightseeing presents its own set of hurdles, with popular attractions often requiring advance reservations on WeChat mini programs, which may pose language and verification barriers for foreigners. China is actively working to rejuvenate inbound tourism, with recent agreements to increase direct flights between Beijing and Washington and simplify visa applications for certain countries. Additionally, the expansion of visa-free access to six countries and efforts to make mobile payment systems more accessible to foreigners demonstrate China's commitment to attracting more visitors in the future. This tells us that getting back to normal after the pandemic has been tough. In response, the Chinese government wants to boost international connections and openness. As part of this, they're trying out a new plan. Starting from December 1, 2023, to November 30, 2024, people from six countries, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, and Malaysia, won't need a visa to visit China. This change aims to make it easier for people from these countries to come to China for business, tourism, visiting family or friends, or even just passing through for up to 15 days without needing a visa. China and the U.S. have reached an agreement to boost the number of weekly flights between them to 24 by the end of October 2023. This is a significant increase from the 340 flights per week that were in operation before the pandemic hit. However, amidst the deteriorating relations between the Chinese government and the U.S., along with its allies, many Western nations are feeling wary and cautious towards Beijing. This sentiment of distrust extends to tourists as well. One major hurdle for foreign tourists in China is the limited acceptance of foreign credit cards by local merchants. Even cash transactions can be quite challenging. In China, whether you're shopping at street vendors or big department stores, transactions are mainly conducted through platforms like WeChat and Alipay. Additionally, China isn't very accommodating to individual foreign travelers. For instance, popular apps like Google Maps and Google Translate are inaccessible, and communication tools like WhatsApp don't function either. Posting pictures or updates on social media platforms is also restricted. Making matters worse, many road signs in China are in pinyin, the phonetic system for Chinese, instead of English. While efforts are being made to update these signs, the process is slow, and temporary solutions like covering English signage with pinyin using white tape are common. Moreover, international driver's licenses are not recognized in China, preventing foreigners from driving within the country. The timing of China's announcement of a pilot visa waiver program seems a bit awkward. Mainland China is currently grappling with widespread outbreaks of various illnesses, 
including mycoplasma pneumonia, influenza, and the new coronavirus. Children's hospitals across the country are overwhelmed, yet transparency regarding these health issues remains a challenge. Despite these concerns, the Visa Waiver Program offers convenience for tourists and business travelers and may appeal to certain demographics. According to statistics from the National Immigration Administration, from December 1st to the 3rd, the number of personnel entering China from relevant countries continued to rise. In total, nearly 18,000 people entered China from these countries, with an average daily entry of 39% higher than on November 30th. Among them, nearly 7,000 people entered China visa-free, accounting for 39% of the total number of entries from these countries. This fully demonstrates that the unilateral visa-free policy has indeed brought tangible convenience to the people of these six countries. In the next step, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will continue to optimize visa policies, actively create favorable conditions, and provide more convenience for smooth exchanges between Chinese and foreign personnel. To further promote the development of high-quality services for exchanges between Chinese and foreign personnel and enhance the level of openness to the outside world, China has decided to pilot the expansion of unilateral visa-free entry to nationals holding ordinary passports from six countries, France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, and Malaysia. This policy will be implemented from December 1, 2023, to November 30, 2024. Individuals holding ordinary passports from the aforementioned countries can enter China visa-free for purposes such as business, tourism, sightseeing, visiting relatives and friends, and transit for up to 15 days during the specified period. There are hardly any cars returning to Shanghai. You should also document this. On New Year's Eve, the streets of Shanghai are devoid of cars. We were one of only two cars on the road. This lady in the car said, nowadays, you can cross the road freely, and there's no one on the buses. Both Shanghai locals and out-of-towners are nowhere to be seen. What's going on? Shanghai, during the Lunar New Year, resembles a ghost town. The streets of Shanghai are now virtually devoid of pedestrians and vehicles. It's like a ghost town. Shanghai netizens say that Shanghai is experiencing an unprecedented Lunar New Year ghost town. Last year, due to the sudden outbreak of the epidemic, Shanghai turned into a ghost town to prevent the spread of the virus. This year, it's even scarier. Everyone has gone home for the new year. Look, even the subway is empty. Brothers, the subway is empty. Nobody's riding the subway. Everyone has gone home for the new year. It's tough, seeing only a few people in such a big city. This completely subverts the traditional belief that houses should never be empty. With a large number of migrant workers leaving the city to return home, the city center of Shanghai has become less populated, with fewer cars and people on the main roads. Apart from a few local vehicles sparsely scattered on the main roads, there are hardly any out-of-town vehicles to be seen. During the Lunar New Year period, first-tier cities almost always become ghost towns. Many migrant workers choose to return home for the New Year. The phenomenon of ghost towns reflects China's economic imbalance. If a farmer can earn the same income at home as in the city, would they be willing to travel back and forth every year? This lady said, only in China do we have the spring festival travel rush. There would be no spring festival travel rush without a large number of people leaving their hometowns. The spring festival travel rush is not about the happiness of going home, it's a migration of suffering. Migrant workers' migration is for supporting their families and making a living. For hundreds of millions of migrant workers and laborers, it's a difficult journey, filled with bitterness. It's a journey where having a job means no home, and having a home means no job. They cannot find a place for their souls in a strange land, and their hometowns cannot accommodate their bodies. A place called home cannot provide a way to support their families, and a place where they can support their families cannot be called home. Thus, they become wanderers, and thus, the spring festival travel rush begins. In recent years, China's economic downturn and the internationalization of metropolises have led to Shanghai also becoming desolate. With a large amount of foreign capital withdrawing, Shanghai has become a ghost town, especially during the new year, it becomes even more desolate and quiet. Middle-class citizens of Shanghai express that many shops have closed down and the market is in a mess. Even tourism can only be done on a budget. The prosperous areas of Shanghai have become ghost towns, and the real estate industry has hit a dead end. Miss Sun said, the economy is very bad now, 
and even Shanghai is in a slump. If you go to Lujiazui, Shanghai's famous commercial center, you'll see how deserted it is. The bustling Plaza 66 is now deserted. The shopping centers near the Himalayas on the other side of Little Lujiazui used to be lively, but now they are almost like ghost towns. What can be done about it? How can real estate be developed? Real estate was supposed to sell houses, but now I can't. So, I go into holding properties, and I go into operations, but that's not working either. Talking about the prospects of commercial real estate, Ms. Sun believes it's not optimistic. People have no money, and consumption is declining. Now, if you go to the Raffles City, it's basically a place for buying luxury goods. Before, business was booming, and the annual growth rate was good, but last year's data was dismal. Chinese people used to buy luxury goods or high-end skincare products, but now they don't have money and are buying domestic goods. What impresses ordinary people the most is that they don't even stay at international five-star hotels now, or the prices of five-star hotels have dropped to the level of unimaginable state on hotels, or to the level of Chinese domestic brands. The prices of local brands are the same, and people have no money. If you want to promote real estate development, you have to let people make money, make more money, and then they will buy houses. He said, now, the unemployment rate is so high, you know, during the New Year holiday, if you can still find a seat on the Shanghai subway, what does that mean? During the New Year in Shanghai, there are no cars on the elevated roads. It's completely empty up there, this is the best time for city work. Many people have already left, they have all evacuated. So how can you do consumer circulation? You can't circulate internally, and you can't circulate externally, right? So you can only wait for the news. How can ordinary people do when you make them wait? They can only wait for the news. Let us show you the current situation in Dongguan. There's nobody here, I've taken over the whole city. Now the whole of Dongguan is mine, it's all mine. Netizens say that during the new year, come out and see the situation outside of Dongguan, Guangdong. At this moment during normal times. It's the busiest time for the night market. As the new year approaches, everything becomes quiet. This is Shurjie Town in Dongguan. Walking on the streets at this moment, there are very few people, and many stores have closed and gone home for the new year. It's hard to find a restaurant to eat in, and there are also fewer cars parked on both sides of the street. At this moment, the night market is also very dim, with only a few lights left here for the new year. Without buying a set of cooking tools for yourself, I'm afraid you could only eat instant noodles during the new year. Walking on the residential streets, even the lights are dimmer. The big stalls here are also closed early on another street. This is a commercial street near the entrance of a factory in Dongguan. It's a relatively large factory in Dongguan, and now let's take a look at the situation at the factory gate to see if there are any restaurants still open here. This is a row of commercial streets at the factory gate. Usually, there are a lot of people here, and each store is crowded with people. At this moment, it's also very deserted, and most of the stores have closed and gone home. Walking on this street, there are hardly any people. The neon lights that are usually bright at the night market are now dim. Walking on the streets of Guangdong at this moment, one can taste the loneliness. Although the weather is still quite good, but it's really cold. Looking at the tall buildings, not a single light can be seen. Walking on the streets, you can't hear any bustling noises, and you can't find a restaurant when you go out. This is Guangdong during the new year. Look, this is the real situation of Dongguan during the new year. Many shops have already closed and gone home. It's the new year, and the shops here are the same. Going all the way down, most of them have already closed and gone home. Look at those across the street. Shops, Guangzhou's new year has also entered a ghost town mode. There are few pedestrians on the streets, no more traffic, and no hustle and bustle of people coming and going. More of it is desolation, and Guangzhou's prosperity relies on the support of outsiders. Every year during the spring festival, outsiders return home leaving behind deserted roads. Fewer people, shops closed, and it's very desolate. A lady from Shanghai said, it's around 8.30 in the morning on the 29th of the lunar month, and I'm on my way to work. It's almost New Year's Eve, and the road is too quiet. There are hardly any pedestrians, and occasionally one or two cars pass by. 
This is the first subway ride I take every day, and the subway station is particularly empty. This is the road I take to work after getting off the subway. In the past few years, the roads were congested with people and vehicles every day, but look at it now, there are hardly any pedestrians today. There are hardly any cars either. An elderly person who came to the supermarket to shop said, the economy is not good anymore and the workers have all gone back to their hometowns for the new year. After the epidemic three years ago, the number of people in Shanghai has significantly decreased. This is on the subway home at night, the entire carriage is empty, there's no one here. Today's supermarket turnover is also the lowest since I started working. This lady said, during the new year, the supermarkets are usually the busiest these days. Families of all sizes go to the supermarket, and it's almost packed with people. It takes a long time to check out, and there are also stalls selling firecrackers and couplets on the streets. Some small supermarkets will display frozen goods outside for sale. After the 23rd of the lunar month, every household starts to get busy, cleaning, preparing New Year goods, and the New Year atmosphere gradually becomes stronger. Now, it's deserted, look, this is Line 2 that runs through Shanghai from east to west, and there are hardly any people, it's particularly deserted. It's only a little past 9 o'clock on my way home, and there's not a single pedestrian. It feels like celebrating the New Year in Shanghai is really meaningless, there's not even a hint of New Year atmosphere. Mr. Wang Zhongming, who owns multiple properties in Shanghai, told the media that most of the storefronts outside are closed now, especially in downtown areas, such as the bars on Zintiandi and Huashan Road in Shanghai, as well as the cafes and bars on Yuyuan Road. Over the past few years, large-scale shopping malls have been developed, and they are now closing on a large scale, with only two or three still open. The department stores downstairs of New World Shopping Mall across from a shop in the northeast are basically empty, and various weird shops are now closed. He said many of them were opened by foreigners, but many have closed down, and they have become Chinese-owned. Mr. Wang also mentioned that Shanghai New Passenger Station, also known as Shanghai Railway Station, has a large number of small shops nearby, most of which have closed. He introduced that the owners of these small shops are Shanghai locals, and most of the sales staff were young people from out of town. Public information shows that Shanghai's well-known Pacific Department Store in Suwei District has exited the Shanghai market. The mall has been in operation for 30 years since it opened in 1993, with a total area of nearly 30,000 square meters. Before this store closed, the Pacific Department Store Huaihai Road Store and the Nocturnal City Store had also closed. It's really a mess. He said that now the market isn't a mess, and he has never seen Shanghai like this before, neither high-end nor mid-range nor low-end can survive. Mr. Wong learned that in some places where high-end restaurants gather, such as Nanjing East Road Pedestrian Street and Bun No. 1 and No. 8, they are also struggling. Mr. Wong said, in the past, everyone fought to rent storefronts in Fengxian District, but now the storefronts cannot be rented out, and ordinary people have no money. As a middle class, Mr. Wan said, now, even traveling has become budget traveling for us. He said, a group of retired elderly people around me used to go to Kunming to escape the summer every August, but now they can only stay in hotels that cost 30 yuan a night. Places that used to cost thousands of yuan to visit have no visitors. The empty skyscrapers, sparsely populated shopping centers, and deserted highways with numerous unfinished construction sites paint a bleak picture of Shenzhen Shanghai once hoped to become the little Hong Kong of mainland China but now plunged into economic depression. This is another unfinished project personally deployed by the top leaders of the Chinese Communist Party. Property prices in Shanghai plummeted from 130,000 to 30,000 yuan per square meter, with no takers and no interest. The initial investment in Shanghai was $45 billion, with official media calling it the future international technology and financial center of mainland China, positioned strategically to leverage Hong Kong's services for the mainland and the world. However, the reality is far from the initial hype. Qianhai, often described as the special zone within the special zone of Shenzhen, saw personal involvement from the top leadership, including three visits by the Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping himself. Yet, the prime office rents in Shenzhen have plummeted to levels seen a decade ago. Qianhai's office vacancy rates are at their highest, with entire floors left unoccupied. It's a desolate landscape, 
with developers struggling to attract tenants despite offering competitive prices. The situation is dire for property owners. Shanghai Shanjian Financial Building went under the hammer 13 times in four years, with prices dropping from 24.96 million to 8.33 million yuan, a staggering 66% decrease. Yet, there are still no takers, resulting in significant losses for property owners who directly lose two properties. Shanghai's office market is now in shambles, with listed prices in residential areas like Meiyuan Temple plummeting to around 95,700 yuan per square meter, down from previous highs of 170,000 to 180,000 yuan per square meter. Foxconn's operations came under government scrutiny. I'm currently in the Liangcheng area of the Shanghai zone. It's 7 p.m., the peak rush hour, but there's a significant decrease in people compared to before. Previously, it used to be packed with employees, with some working over 100 hours of overtime in October. But now, there's hardly any overtime work in November. It's a significant impact on ordinary workers like us. It's 7.11 p.m. now, and during peak hours, there are only four buses, all of them full. It's incomparable to before, when this place used to be packed with employees during rush hours. Even the peak hours for tricycle taxis are affected. Tricycle drivers are calling out fares of 2 yuan per ride. Yesterday, on the 15th, another large batch of people left, and there's still no policy to retain employees. You think it won't have an impact? If Foxconn really moves out, how much will it affect Hanan? How much will it affect us, the workers? Some Foxconn employees say that when their contracts end, and they become unemployed, with only two months left until the new year, where will they transition to? Isn't it terrifying? Will there be another company for us to work for? Someone asked if there will be another one. But who would it be? Nobody knows. Recently, Shandong Shulang Clothing Factory officially declared bankruptcy due to inability to repay its debts, leaving tens of thousands of employees jobless. One employee said, I saw on TikTok that Shulang went bankrupt, so I hurried here, thinking of spending my stored value card before it's too late. But now, I can't use it anymore. They're already in bankruptcy liquidation. If you come here, you have to fill out a debt repayment form and bring your ID card and stored value card, and they'll guide you through the process. Because the company is in such a dire situation, today, I was informed by HR that I'm being laid off. Sigh, I'm also being laid off along with many others. Most of my colleagues have already left. Yeah, I've been laid off, and suddenly, I don't know what to do next. Honestly, I've been thinking about this on my way home from work, but no matter how much I think about it, the ultimate result is that I've been laid off. I have to accept this reality. It's really disorienting, I don't know what to do next. People, don't let your children get back pain, just tell them not to play too much with their phones, and stop spending lavishly. Look, life is not easy, okay? Understand? Good. I want to study harder in my next life. This job is too hard. I can't sustain my life. In the midst of the pandemic, the life of long-haul truck drivers has become incredibly challenging. Deliveries that used to take just a day now require at least three days. Previously, a journey on the highway took a mere 10 minutes, but now, highways and provincial roads are constantly congested, with delays of four to five hours or even more being a common occurrence. Unloading goods at the destination now necessitates a 48-hour nucleic acid test proof. Accidentally passing through an epidemic area may result in immediate quarantine, posing the risk of suspension from work. Fuel prices have surged to 8 yuan per liter, and gas prices have skyrocketed to 10 yuan per liter. However, freight charges have not increased at all. Each trip requires meticulous calculations, but truck drivers cannot afford to stop because they have families to support and monthly loan repayments to make. The truck drivers during the pandemic are facing a tough struggle for survival. In the hustle of China's busy economy, a big problem is hitting its important transport routes, seriously affecting the country's supply chain. Truck drivers, who are usually seen as essential to China's business, are now struggling to survive. The economy is down, the pandemic messed up logistics, and these drivers are often exploited. The challenges faced by them go beyond the economic downturn, but about humane problems. Their tough reality is a stark contrast to China's image of being a strong and prosperous industrial nation. My friend died, another one of my friends at the age of 39, a driver from Hunan, reacted severely to the high plateau in western Tibet.
left the world forever. Two children at home, the elder is 15 years old, the younger is just a few years old. What will his parents do? What about his wife and children? At 39 years old, he left like this without any illness due to the high altitude reaction. It is very hard and life threatening as a truck driver. Many people said being truck drivers are easy since only uneducated people do it, especially those unscrupulous freight owners and dishonest businesses, delaying and even not paying their transportation fees. Do you not feel guilty? Do you know how difficult it is for truck drivers to earn a bit of transportation fee? In 2023, numerous truck drivers died suddenly, countless every year. Whether on the Sichuan Tibet line or the Qinghai Tibet line, due to high altitude reactions, one after another left this world. For those of you who still owe transportation fees to truck drivers, I beg you, we have it really bad out here. One of the striking manifestations of the economic downturn is the severe drop in freight rates in China. According to recent insights, the global shipping industry, including China as one of the key players, remains entrenched in a freight recession expected to last into 2024 or even into 2025. This downturn stems from factors such as high inventories and a marked pullback in consumer spending, directly affecting the demand for logistic services. After selling trucks for so many years, I found that the truck driver was really poor, with a lot of debt, and couldn't even come up with a down payment of tens of thousands of yuan. How can anyone survive in such a situation? Moreover, U.S. manufacturing orders in China have seen a dramatic 40% reduction, further exacerbating the decline in the need for freight services and contributing to the oversupply of transportation capacity. This mismatch between supply and demand has led to a catastrophic decline in freight rates, affecting all stakeholders in the logistics chain but most acutely impacting truck drivers who rely on these rates for their income. Wuhan Iron and Steel Transportation Department in Xinjiang, Wuhan the entire place is deserted. With the economic downturn, many companies in China have become such a mess. Yonda Express is so bad that no one delivers to the site and few people are working at the site. China's trucking industry on the brink as revenues plummet and overcapacity bites. The road freight industry in China faces a dire and worsening situation. Despite initial optimism at the start of 2023 as COVID controls relax, the reality has proven far worse. Logistics companies have seen revenues plunge by 30% compared to 2022, with freight rates in freefall. Truck driver incomes have collapsed, with short haul rates down 80%. This crisis builds on existing downturn even before COVID, the industry had entered a negative spiral of oversupply and falling prices. Netizens took aerial photos of the new STO Express Transshipment Center in Loaha, where the express delivery warehouses were full and piled up like mountains. Many logistic companies are deserted. Seems like they cannot pay proper wage for the truckers considering the amount of stuff laying around. The latest industry figures paint a depressing picture. The truck fleet shrank by 66,000 vehicles in 2022 as nearly 200,000 trucks were taken off the roads. Tonnage hauled fell over 5% to 37 billion tons, a significant decline. And while there was a small rebound in early 2023, this is likely only a dead cat bounce before the next leg down. Several factors have combined to crush the industry. First, years of overinvestment and oversupply, too many trucks chasing too little cargo. Manufacturing weakness and economic headwinds have reduced freight volumes, yet the truck fleet keeps expanding. Second, debt burdens are still being repaid on many recently purchased trucks, forcing desperate price competition between operators. And technologies like logistics automation have accelerated the commoditization of road freight. As these drivers navigate through tough times, their situation reveals a major issue in China's supply system. It's like a quiet alarm signaling a risk of collapse beneath the surface of the country's economic success. The once respected drivers now represent a bigger problem, casting a shadow on China's economic strength. The outlook for truck drivers in 2024 appears grim, with looming unemployment driven by a decline in purchasing power over the past three decades. Mortgage payments have drained 90% of the population's resources, leaving little for consumer spending, resulting in unsold factory goods and closures. The emergence of freight platforms worsens the situation, pushing shipping rates lower, especially for long trailers. Predictions suggest truck drivers may face up to 15 days of idle time each month due to economic challenges, forcing many to consider leaving the industry. This extended downtime, coupled with reduced opportunities, may lead drivers to resort to illegal modifications, risking safety on the roads. Challenges extend to inadequate access to proper meals, with many drivers resorting to unhealthy options. Sudden deaths among drivers are attributed to exhaustion and stress, highlighting the toll of the job. 
Feeling undervalued and mistreated, truck drivers endure difficulties from gatekeepers, warehouse staff, and toll booth operators, exacerbated by tight schedules and financial penalties. There seems little hope of a turnaround. Dual carbon policies will increase costs, while global instability hampers trade. And despite bold visions of an intelligent logistics future, the reality of the present is basic overcapacity and cutthroat competition. The government offers promises about reform and upgrade plans, but for truckers on the edge of bankruptcy, these so-called promises are just empty talk. If all trucks were to stop operating, here's what would happen. On the first day, highways would be exceptionally clear, but by the third day, certain ride-sharing and delivery platforms might declare bankruptcy due to the halted operations. Logistics and courier services would pile up, leading to shortages in supermarket supplies by the fifth day, causing a nationwide surge in prices. Massive population rushes to supermarkets would occur, with even basic vegetables being sold at exorbitant prices. By the seventh day, factories would struggle with stockpiles that couldn't be transported, leading to direct liquidation and closure. After 10 days, agricultural equipment would start facing surplus, prompting a migration of urban populations to rural areas to engage in farming. Truck drivers can support millions of families in this nation, yet we cannot support our own. Why? The downfall of the industry started early. Even in 2022, the express delivery industry in China found itself navigating through the eye of a storm that had raged on in the form of multiple epidemics. The economic turmoil that ensued was a direct consequence of weakened social mobility across provinces, which lay the groundwork for what can only be described as a challenging year for an industry heavily reliant on circulation. According to the State Post Bureau, the industry managed a meager year-on-year -year increase of 2.1% in business volume and 2.3% in revenue. While ostensibly positive, these figures represent a marked decline from the growth rates witnessed in previous years, underscoring the severe blow dealt by the pandemic. The provincial data paints an even more distressing picture, with growth rates of express delivery business volume falling significantly behind the national average in a majority of the provinces. On January 26, early in the morning at around 8 o'clock, without even changing the tires, my old truck is still holding on, as there is no money to buy a new tire. I had to settle for putting on my worn-out spare tire. Gotta hold on, gotta keep pushing. It cost me over 3,000 yuan for just changing one tire, and they dismantled it right in Zhangzhou, Hunan, heading straight to Changsha, Hunan. Two-thirds of the delivery job is done now, with about 10 more strands to go, I should be able to finish it up. Who cares, if the tire doesn't fit up front, just install it higher. Parking fees here exceed two hours, so I stood by the roadside and covered myself with canopy. From my current location to the slope road towards the beijing hong Kamakau route, navigating a distance of 783 kilometers. The winter has come for China's trucking sector. Years of overexpansion have left the industry vulnerable, and a confluence of economic and technological factors now threaten its very survival. Furthermore, the disparity between express business volume and income growth in provinces such as Zhejiang and Hebei, where volume increased but revenue fell, lays bare the inefficiencies and unsustainable business practices exacerbated by the pandemic. Shanghai's situation, where a drastic drop in express delivery business volume was accompanied by an increase in business revenue, raises questions about the long-term viability and operational models of the express delivery industry in the face of such crises. Amidst this backdrop of despair, research pertaining to the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on the express delivery industry offers little solace. Studies have highlighted how the pandemic facilitated the spread of viruses through express boxes, further curtailing consumer confidence in the delivery services and adding layers of complexity to an already struggling sector. Additional research focusing on the stock market performance of express delivery companies illustrates significant structural changes and resilience disparities between corporate-owned and franchise store chains during the pandemic. This indicates a broader, more systemic vulnerability within the industry to external shocks such as COVID-19. Ultimately, the express delivery industry's struggles in 2022 are emblematic of the broader economic fragility exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. The synthesis of epidemiological threats and economic vulnerabilities has not only led to a significant downturn in the express delivery sector but has also cast a long shadow over the prospects of a swift recovery. As the industry stumbles through the turbulence induced by the pandemic, the road ahead appears daunting, painted with uncertainty and devoid of easy solutions.